As quoted by Edward Teller, the science of today is the technology of tomorrow. A very good afternoon to one and all present. I extend a warm welcome to everyone for the keynote address of Sim Research 2022. Investment in science, technology, and innovation is essential for economic development and social progress of a country, and thus it is important to understand the framework associated with the same. To enlighten more on this topic, we have the privilege of having Dr. Shekhar Mande, sir, former Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research India. I now kindly request Dr. Shekhar Mande, sir, to come on the stage. Can we have a round of applause, please? It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to be able to be with you. What I would like to do is to tell you a little bit about how science, technology and innovation and the systems have evolved over the years, perhaps around the world. Uh, let us have a very brief history and then how we can actually do further. Uh, most of my examples would be from CSIR uh, because I have just remitted the office uh, of CSIR Director General. So my examples mostly would be from CSIR which are post-independent. But I would also try to get some pre-independent uh, examples as well. And how actually it benefits society enormously. And what is it that we need to do in the coming times. Now when we talk of innovation, that probably Dr. Mashaka would have told you, innovation is something which really does not require a person to be trained in innovating. You know, I mean, a person should not really be trained, let us say, in science or technology or any other aspects of learning, but a person should only be curious and should keep continuously asking questions whether what the person is doing, he or she, that particular activity would benefit people around him or her in a large sense. You know, I mean, if I do some little bit thing here and there, and whether it would have an impact on people around that person. Now, examples of innovation exist all around. We very often don't to notice them. And some of the examples uh, that I can actually quote, I mean, let, let me take one example. If you have gone to Himalayas for either tourism purpose or for whatever reasons, you would notice that at the foothills of Himalayas all across, right? I mean, you start from Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, and all the way up to Northeast, you will find existence of what is called as gharat. Have must have seen the water mills. Water is flowing down the hills, and that water is used as a flower mill. There's a gharat, a small hut that is made, and on a stone it falls, the stone rotates, and just like our chakki, uh, it uh, creates a flower out of uh, uh, wheat or whatever. The thing is, these gharats have existed since 7th century AD in India. So for more than about 1500 years, they have been around. And to take ourselves back 1500 years ago, it's very difficult to imagine that how did people evolve such a thing? Did they, be, did they have very deep knowledge of science and technology? Did they know how things work? Did they know about water driving motions, especially the circular motion of the wheel? We don't know. Maybe they did, maybe they did not. But the important aspect of this is that somebody who noticed this particular aspect, that water can drive motion of objects, and that motion of objects can be used uh, in a very gainful manner for humanity, is something outstanding. Right? To think of it, about 1500 years ago, somebody thought of it and prepared these gharats, and then people used to take their grains to the gharat and bring back flour. It's just outstanding. And examples like this are abundant every year, everywhere. And wherever you see around our ancient culture, cities, and wherever, these kind of examples are actually plenty everywhere. It's just that we don't seem to notice them, and just we don't seem them to relate them to a particular scientific discovery. The science and technology community is rather notorious. We try to relate everything to a particular scientific principle or a discovery or a big work having been done some lab, and then Every innovation we try to correlate to that. The point that I'm trying to make is that it's not necessary that way. You know, I mean, innovations exist 
despite the science and technology laboratories around the society. And if we actually take that in our stride, I think we will probably have much better appreciation for the society even in the coming times. Now the movement to support science through public funds, uh, that means, I mean, whatever, whenever taxes are collect collected from general public, and a part of those taxes is used to support science and technology is rather recent phenomena. It's not a very age-old phenomena, where all the taxes that have been collected from public uh, have been used, part of that has been used to promote science and technology disciplines is somewhat new. It gained further momentum only post-1945. The post-war era is really the one which uh, promoted the SNT movement and the public funding of that all around the world. So many of the uh, organizations around the world, for example, if you take NSF in USA, came post-1945. You know, I mean, so basically, how do we support, how does the public support science and technology is rather recent. In India, uh, there has been a movement, of course, that how does public support science and technology? And one of the outstanding examples is in Pune, where the uh, public could uh, support uh, science and technology, and this uh, goes back to 1880s, when uh, in uh, society here, plague was very prevalent. Every few years, every 10 or 20 years, there used to be an epidemic, or other pandemic of plague. And at that time, people like Lokman Tirak they thought that public should get together and think about how plague vaccine can be made. You know, and that plague vaccine, to be able to make plague vaccine, Lokman Tirak proposed a laboratory, saying that whatever knowledge we have gained over the years, scientific knowledge, and what we understand of diseases such as plague, if that can be used to make a vaccine. It's very fascinating. And what started was something called an imperial lab in Pune. Imperial labs eventually moved to Mukteshwar after a few years. And believe it or not, it still exists. And perhaps many students would have heard the name of the lab that I'm going to name, but would not have recognized that this was Imperial Labs. Today, it exists in a city called Izzatnaka in UP, and it is called Indian Veterinary Research Institute, IVRI. So it was founded by Lokmane Tirak in Pune, and eventually having moved all over the place, it settled down in Izzatnagar today. But the idea behind was can people get together and meaningfully apply the knowledge that what we have for the benefit of mankind. That was there. And of course, the funding and resources was not very easy to come. But whatever resources people could raise on their own, appealing to public, crowdsourcing, what we call today crowdsourcing and others, uh, have been actually practiced since then. Now we fast forward ourselves to 1940s and uh, as around the world people were thinking that uh, 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 science and technology can be supported through public funds, in India also it gained momentum. In 1933, there was an editorial written in a magazine called Nature. Most of the scientists in the audience read Nature. And the editorial actually argued for a very strong case of supporting science and technology in India through public funds. The uh, three academies that came later, the National Academy of Science, the Indian National Science Academy, and Indian Academy of Science, were essentially a fallout of this particular moment then. But the British forgot that they had to support science and technology through this. And a gentleman called Sir Arkot Ramaswamy Mudliya, who was a member of the British Council, took this up and reminded British again and again, and essentially what we call today as lobbying, but in those times we would have called persuasion, persuaded the British to start an organization which would be a science and technology organization. And a board of scientific and industrial research was born out of it in 1940, which eventually was rechristened as Industrial Research Utilization Committee, IRUC. And in 1942, it became an organization which was publicly funded what we call as the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. You know? So this was the... So there's a brief history of how CSIR really started. Uh, this was an organization in which British committed really funds every year, that they would give funds to this organization, and the organization could carry out R&D. 
Now, many other labs had existed earlier. I mean, some of the ICMR labs have existed since 50 years before that. You know, and some of the ICAR labs, they also have existed for a long time. But for the first time, we have an evidence in which government said that we will every year give you funds to do science and technology in the country. And that was remarkable. Part of the funds also came from industrial houses. Now, let us see, I mean, how 80 years ago things were. Today, it's much more difficult to raise resources through industry. I mean, we find much more challenging to raise resources through industry than those times. And none other than the Tatas, they came forward and said that we will fund CSI. So about one-fifth of the grant, what was given to CSI by the British, was given by the Tatas. And Tatas said that you please establish a laboratory in Pune, the laboratory which will focus on chemical sciences. And Tatas gave, in 1945, a grant of eight and a half lakh rupees. And that was given to start National Chemical Laboratory, what we actually see here today. And as we move on, we see that uh, uh, things progressed. A lot of groundwork had been done by our scientists who were pre-independent. Uh, they had very correct ideas of how science and technology would be done in the country and how science and technology would lead to formation of supporting industries and how together the laboratories and the industry would work together for the benefit of society. These actually were ideas that our forefathers had thought of. You know, I mean, we can go on taking large number of names. For example, Mahindra Lal Sarkar had thought of starting the Indian Association of Cultivation of Science in Calcutta, the place where C.V. Raman did his famous Raman effect work. People like P.C. Ray, uh, when he came back, apart from mercury nitrate that he had synthesized, P.C. Ray also started an industry, what is today called as Bengal Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals. He actually started out of uh, his passion uh, for Indian industry and so on and so forth. Swami Vivekananda, of all the people, and Jamshedji Tata, through an accidental meeting, when they are sailing from Japan to US, 1893, in an accidental meeting, two great personalities on the ship that was sailing at that time, talked of how do we promote knowledge or learning in India. And it is at that time, Swami Vivekananda proposed to Jamshedji Tata, that we must have an educational institute of higher learning where we integrate all branches of modern knowledge into that. Not only that, a couple of years later, Jamshedji Tata offered Swami Vivekananda to become the first director of the so-called institute. Swami Vivekananda being an ascetic, he of course refused. He said that I have no role uh, in directing some institutes and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, by the time this institute was set up, both of them had passed away. And believe it or not, I don't know whether the students uh, have heard this story, the institute came into being in 1907. And today, this institute is pride of India. In all world rankings, this institute is always number one. Last several years is number one, continues to be number one in the world rankings. What is this institute? <laughs> Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Right? So IIC Bangalore was, the ideas for that germinated in a conversation between Swami Vivekananda and Jamshedji Tata. Now that was the spirit of our forefathers. They wanted a strong base for science and technology in India. Eventually we won independence so that we can actually take off from there. Right? And how do we bring innovations in the system? Now let me tell you, about 190 years of British rule, if you say that way, let's say 1757 to 1947, had robbed us of many, many things. You know, I mean, we did not have well-established industry, we did not have proper educational institutions. We had only 20 universities in the country. All over the country, we had only 20 universities. And only one publicly funded organization, the government-funded organization, CSIR, in science and technology. And that's where we started. Whole world had thought that we would disintegrate into multiple nations in no time. No country in the world believed that we can implement democracy, right? And under that background, on 26th August 1947, barely 11 days after independence, and all of you are aware of the thing that uh, the period running to the independence was marked 
with great distress all over the country. There was an artificial line drawn to create two nations, absolutely artificial and absolutely nonsensical to most of us. There was a, a period of time which was very uncertain and consecutive years it had not rained and that led to the famous Bengal famine in which about 3 million people died, 30 lakh people died because they did not get food and that was the period leading to 1947. And it is under this context, nobody thought that India can implement democracy and India decided that it can do it. On 26th August 1947, 27th August, 11 days after uh, we won independence, the society of CSIR met in Delhi, in the South Block. That day, Pandit Nehru was not able to attend, but he had appointed Shama Prasad Mukherjee as the vice president of the society. So Shama Prasad Mukherjee, most of you have heard of him, a great freedom fighter and a great leader, became the first vice president. And who would be inducted into the society? Sir C.V. Raman, Homi Bhava, Birbal Sahani, J.R.D. Tata, Abdul Khwaja Hamid, the founder of Sipla, and so on and so forth. So people, entire who is who of the country had come together saying that science and technology is the vehicle for India to progress. Entire who is who you can think of and Abdul Khwaja Hamid and all, they continued to be part of CSI's governing body for next 20 years. JRD Tata continued to chair the research council of the National Aerospace Laboratory in Bangalore. And that was the strength of our society, that people came together and said that science and technology would be the vehicle for India's growth. And things started rolling. How do we implement democracy in the country? The first challenge, how do you make sure that every person gets to vote. Every person has a right to vote. Whosoever has the right to vote a particular age and above would not be denied that particular privilege to go and vote. And in a country when, where zamindari was so prevalent, a zamindar would not go and cast 50 or 100 votes of his or her laborers. Right? How do you implement that? And the solution that came up was from National Physical Laboratory and they said, that we will ensure that one person votes only once and not more than 10. And how would they do that? They put an indelible ink, right? This indelible ink is nothing but silver nitrate solution, a diluted silver nitrate solution. It stains a variety of things in your body. It cannot be taken off by soap or oil or whatever. You cannot wash it off very easily. And that indelible ink has been used in every election. Those of you who vote now have used this since then and now is exported to 60 different countries. Can you believe it? 1951 general elections in India, we developed indelible ink, which is now exported to 60 different countries for the same reason. It's just amazing. <laughs> After 1757, uh, when the Plas Battle of Plassey, some of you would have heard of Battle of Plassey, every 20 years, 20 or 25 years, there has been a period of famines in the country. And those of you who re read history of famines in India would actually be very depressed at the end of it. Every 25 years there has been a famine. Each famine has killed more than a million people. Each famine has killed more than a million people, 10 lakh people every, every 25 years is like this. 1965 was a famine-like situation in India. We had not had rain uh, significant rain in the previous time. Our food grain production was not great. All of you have heard Green Revolution. India appealed to different countries to provide us grains and very generous offer came from United States. There's a project called PL480. Some of you would have heard of PL480, that project. And the grains were imported. Uh, the United States was very generous in providing at that time. PL480 grains were stored in Delhi in a godown that godown today, those of you who have visited Delhi, today that godown's name is Technology Bhavan and the house of Department of Science and Technology is actually there, the headquarter of Department of Science and Technology. That was the godown of PL480. But this was the time to think, are we going to depend upon other countries for our food gain production? And just then, it was realized that Norman Borlaug 
had developed a dwarf variety of wheat. Right? While working, he has uh, developed a dwarf variety. And that would be very good for cultivating all over. And recognizing this particular fact, uh, C. Subramaniam, who was then the agriculture minister, decided that India must become self-independent in production of food grains. And he decided to invite Norman Burlog to India. His visit was facilitated by a very senior IS officer called Shivram and Professor M.S. Swaminathan, who was at IRI then. And together, this team decided that we would start cultivating this particular aspect. This was, of course, preceded by formation of canals across Punjab and Haryana, the dams which were made for irrigation, water would be available. And together, they decided that we are actually going to start cultivating this particular variety. There's another problem that came, is that our agriculture was manual till then. Right? And we used to use bullock carts uh, for uh, plowing our fields. And it was felt that we should start manufacturing tractors in the country. All the tractors till then were imported from Bulgaria. And India's foreign currency situation had become very precarious. So the government decided that we must make indigenous tractor. And they roped in the Central Mechanical Engineering Research Institute, the headquarter in Durgapur, but they also have a branch in Ludhiana. And the Ludhiana branch made the first tractor in the country, what is called, you would have seen on the roads, as the Swaraj tractor. And today what you also see as Sonalika tractor. And India became completely independent, at least in the manufacture of tractors. Similarly, pesticides were made in National Chemical Laboratory here in Pune and the Regional Research Laboratory in Hyderabad. And together, irrigation, the correct variety of crop that could be planted, and pesticides and mechanization together made the Green Revolution possible. Can you believe it? 1965, we were in a situation where we were looking at an imminent famine. But because of all this, 1970 onwards, we are completely self-sufficient on our grain production. Not only that, we also export grains to most other countries. It's amazing how SNT has been applied for our society. I want to give one last example before I come to health. I think I'm already 25 minutes through. So uh, 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 this is a very interesting example. Many people would not have probably heard of this example, and I thought I should mention this particular example here. See, India has had very poor death threat at the time of independence. The death because of multiple reasons. You know, I mean, uh, all variety of reasons. Our health parameters were not very good. Our average life expectancy was only in the 20s. You know, in 1947, the average life expectancy was very in the 20s. Our literacy rate was only 12%. And therefore, we had to actually make sure that we improve upon these parameters. And today, our life expectancy has gone into the 70s, and our literacy rate is about 75%. It's amazing. In 75 years, what we can do? No other country has ever done that. Right? I mean, there are about 60 different countries which became independent about the time that India became independent, plus minus 5, 10 years. Only India stands out as an example which did it. And we did it because we had chosen science and technology as a vehicle of growth. All right? So the example that I want to tell you is about infant deaths. So in 1947, there's a large number of infants who would die because either their mothers would have died during pregnancy or because they were non-lactating mothers and so on and so forth. It was a very critical problem. How do you actually get over infant death? And the solution that was thought that how do we prevent infant death was we must make at least milk possible, milk available, to all the infants all around the country. Now, the problem with milk production was uh, uh, Gujarat and Maharashtra were powerhouses of milk production, but it could not be easily transported to Bihar, Jharkhand, and uh, Uttar Pradesh, and so on and so forth. Right? And one way that was thought that we could transport milk, of course, cold chains did not exist, was we can actually convert that milk into milk powder. You know, I mean, that was the thing that people thought that if you can convert it into milk powder, and all around the world, people have actually done the same, that to transport the milk powder is stable for a long time, as all of you know. So there's a committee set up in 1957 called the Krishan Chand Committee. Krishan Chand is a very famous person, rather infamous person. Uh, you can go and read about him in Google. He was the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi during emergency, and you can think what he would have done. 
and uh, uh, of course he died under very mysterious circumstances later but krishan chand committee had several international experts on the problem of how do you transport milk into powder form from places where it is produced to places where it is needed how do you do that this committee had people from scotland had people from new zealand had people from switzerland some of the top rated scientists around the world and a committee report 1957 eventually says at the bottom that indian milk cannot be converted into powder all right i mean if you get international experts just to tell you that you cannot do it where to get them so uh, uh, and the reason that indian milk is predominantly buffalo milk it is high in uh, fat while european and other countries is predominantly cow milk which is not as high in fat right so the committee left it there saying that more r&d is needed to convert this high fat milk into milk powder what would vargis kurian do vargis kurian of course all of you have heard the father of uh, white revolution what would he do he flew down to central food technology research institute in mysore cftri mysore and then subramaniam was the director of cftri together vargis kurian and subramaniam sat and decided to solve this problem very often as i told you innovations come from scientific facts sometimes not realizing the science behind it innovations need not be always nobel prize winning but innovations have a very deep impact on society that's what i have told you in the beginning they decided they are going to solve the problem and how do you solve the problem the biochemists in the audience would know if you centrifuge high fat milk probably there is a chance that you can separate fat from milk from the soluble part and that's exactly what they did so now what you have is milk which is low in fat and you have fat which is separate so the fat is a by product what do you do with the fat that fat was converted into butter that you eat every day amul butter right what was done with the milk milk was converted into milk powder right that milk could be easily converted into milk powder would this milk powder be uh, good to consume is it fit for consumption because eventually you are addressing the problem of infant deaths right the, the small kids you don't want them to die so vargis kurian and subramaniam decided to fly down or rather to drive down in those days uh, to vello to cmc and then they conducted a clinical trial to show that consumption of milk powder would not lead to any untoward effect on human health rather it would only self lives of save lives of the children in those period and that's how milk powder became a reality from 1970 onwards you know and amul used to uh, sell those in tins some of you will remember those tins that used to come a milk powder in the tin that used to carry a logo of cftri in the early days and those of you who are my age would remember that whenever the milk powder got over our mother used to use that tin for storing dal right and whenever it caught any rust our mother used to store washing powder in that you know so reuse philosophy reuse recycle philosophy has always been there in our country and it was one of the things that it should did and dramatically because of multiple aspects because of the cooperative movements across the country of milk production and distribution because of the well established cold chain networks and because the fact that we can convert the milk into powder together we have solved the problem of milk availability now very often we don't realize what has happened in our lifetimes those of you who are my age would remember that we used to stand in the queue to get milk from government dairy at something like 5 o'clock in the morning the truck used to come at 7 o'clock so 2 hours we would be standing in the queue to get 1 liter of milk for a family of 4 and very often milk would not show up for some reasons and so on and so forth i don't know how many of you remember that and now you have milk available also walk into a store and you can buy a packet of milk amazing what science and technology and innovations have done for the country are absolutely amazing <laughs> now i just want to spend a few minutes about healthcare because this conclave is about healthcare and how we can actually bring multiple innovations of uh, multiple innovations into the healthcare system Uh, i would first take example from uh, the covid period you know i mean 75 years of independence 
have made our country a very confident country. On today's date, any calamity comes, we are capable of addressing that calamity on our own. You know, I mean, you would have seen that multiple national, natural calamities that have come into the country last 75 years, the number of people who have succumbed to those calamities have reduced over a period of time. I don't know, how, do you, how many people do you remember the cyclone in the, uh, about 20 years ago that killed 10,000 people about 20 years ago? On today's date, any time there is a cyclone warning, our predictions are so accurate. And the predictions are made by none other than our IMD, right? IMD institution in Pune, Shimla office that you would have seen. And also by IITM, the Indians of Tropical Medicine, the Tropical Meteorology in uh, uh, Pashan Road. They all make these predictions how the cyclone is going to move. And the predictions are so accurate that 48 hours in advance, they can tell you how the cyclone, cyclone will where it would hit the eye of the storm. And then the administration can get into action and it can evacuate people instantly from there. SMSs today are sent to crores of fishermen. Right? The Indian Council of Agriculture Research sends SMS to fishermen, crores of them, instantly saying that, please don't go out into the sea. Please come back. And it's amazing. And the last cyclone that actually hit in India, about 20 people died in there. So where is 10,000, where is 20? And that has been possible because, once again, as I said, multitude of different reasons of application of SNT. And therefore, when COVID period came, we as a community, we in the sense, everyone including in this hall, we had been exceptionally confident of ourselves. Dr. Ganga Ghedkari is here. He would remember. We attended several meetings uh, together in Delhi with health minister uh, and uh, the health ministry, all of us together. And we used to meet practically every day or every other day or every week at that time. You know, I mean, within CSIR, we had every evening six o'clock meeting on COVID-19, what we are going to do. And we put in place in no time, in record time, a kind of system in which the cases would be reported to a central organization, NCDC. Genomes would be sequenced. Vaccine candidates would be evolved. There would be testing and uh, tracking uh, uh, that would be actually implemented. And people would be isolated as soon as they have been detected with uh, COVID-19, and so on and so forth. And this confident community of scientists and technologists in the country, which both Ganga Khedkar and I, we had the privilege of participating in, did absolutely remarkable job. Absolutely remarkable. <laughs> Western media criticizes us that we have underreported cases, right? Does Western media have come and seen the situation on their own? Or the hypothetical projections that they have made? I have traveled through rural areas in the peak of COVID myself. In rural Haryana, in rural Western Uttar Pradesh, I have traveled on the road myself. Nobody wearing masks there. People, if anyone had COVID-like symptom, was isolated in a room in the house, was not allowed. And most people would spend their time outside, outside the house. And that's the case in rural India anyway, that most of the people are outside, right? And to tell you the fact that even WHO and CDC did not recognize the fact, but we did, was COVID is spread, COVID is airborne. It is spread to the particles that remain suspended in air. And the fact that Western media does not recognize, they still think that rural India had a very high death rate, but it is not to be, right? That's because in rural India, most of the people spend time outside, probably, and the fact that COVID is spread through air. Now, WHO took a long, long time. In fact, WHO called it a global pandemic on 11th March 2020. They could have called it a global pandemic at least a month before, isn't it? WHO did not recognize this airborne. It still kept on insisting that it spreads through touch. There's no scientific evidence that it spreads through touch, through contaminated surfaces, right? And the scientific evidence was generated by multiple laboratories around the world, including us, that is essentially airborne. And if it's airborne, how do you mitigate it? 
we came up with a solution that if it's an airborne disease and if an audience like this sits in a room which is air conditioned and the air is circulated, I mean air conditioned room, air is circulated with a particular mixture of fresh air and a circulated air, also in railway coaches, buses and all. And we said that if this air is sanitized, we can actually reduce probably the incidence of COVID in even in an audience such as this. Our computational fluid dynamics studies showed that in a bus, a 35 seater bus, if one person is infected with COVID, all other 35 people in that bus would be infected in about 35 minutes from that particular point of time because the air is circulated. If we sanitize the air, it would take about four or five hours. How do you sanitize the air? A simple trick, once again, is not rocket science. Before the air actually comes into the room through these vents, you install either UV light behind, which are concealed. Right? The UV lights have to be concealed because they are harmful to humans also. And then make sure that the air which is thrown out has virus which is inactivated. Now you need to show that, right? I mean, with and without UV, whether you get virus which is uh, in the air or not. And we did this experiment in a railway coach that ran between Bandra and Chandigarh for about two months. So we went and we sampled air in this particular railway coach with and without UV and showed that with UV which is sanitizes that particular air, the significance or the number of virus particles which are viable and could be grown once again in the lab drops dramatically, about 1000 or about uh, 10 to the power 6 fold so that what you have is a clean air that actually comes in. Not clean, but rather sanitized air that it comes in into the room. There was a fantastic result. It was eventually published. But we decided that we are going to install this solution in some of the places. And the solution that we implemented was none other than in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha as the first example. So the first time we went to Lok Sabha and said that we are going to install UV lights in the ducts here so that at least our lawmakers are protected from this particular incidence. And we are very proud of that. And the Lok Sabha speaker was very proud when he announced in the Lok Sabha that this hall is actually now sanitized because of this particular reason. <laughs> could we have imagined this pandemic 20 years ago and we could say that we can make our own vaccine? I don't think so. I don't think anyone believes that if this pandemic had stuck us in 1980s, we probably could have said with as much confidence today as we did. So ICMR, through the National Institute of Virology in Pune and Bharat Biotech, they came together and said that inactivated virus, which is a common strategy of many viral diseases, can be used to vaccinate. It's amazing. Together, NIV and Bharat Biotech came and said that we can do that. And Bharat Biotech very quickly put in a clinical trial protocol ICMR conducted clinical trials across the country. A large number of people it was shown. And the efficacy of the virus was shown, uh, efficacy of the vaccine, the covaxin, was shown to be close to about 72%, if I'm not wrong, right? I mean, about 72 or 75%. Which is not very different than Covishield that we actually have taken from AstraZeneca. So the thing is that we were actually able to come up with our own vaccine was unimaginable 20 years ago. And of course, a minor part of this vaccine, of course I should tell, is what is called as an adjuvant, as a molecule that stimulates your immune system, was also made in India. We of course took it from an American company, Bharat Biotech took it from an American company, and we started synthesizing that in a much cheaper way. So the innovations in India, as I said, have also been kind of frugal innovations in which we make things much, much cheaper than what they could be made. And the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology in Hyderabad started making this adjuvant, the synthetic process, at about one-tenth of the cost that could have been actually taken from US. And that made this vaccine possible and cheap that could be distributed amongst all the people. And unbelievable, a population of size of India, right, all the adult population of India, the size of India, 1.4 billion people, more than uh, okay, 2 billion doses have already been delivered and also in the remotest possible areas. I don't know whether the other day when Dr. Jitendra Singh was here, did he mention about the 
uh, drones and the delivery of vaccines in remote areas. Dr. Jitendra Singh actually had a chance to inaugurate this particular thing, the drone, in Jammu, when all of us had gone together. And we showed that vaccines can be, the ice box carrying vaccines can be loaded on a drone and delivered to a remote area, which would otherwise take six to seven hours of road travel, but we could do it within half an hour and they're using the drone. <laughs> Amazing. Which other country has done? So all the negative reports that you would read on channels like CNN or BBC or something, I sometimes wonder how much really are they well founded? You know, when we have seen things with your own eyes and when we read reports in the media which appear counter to what actually you have seen, very often we actually start wondering whether the media is doing justice to us or not. You know, whether the Western media is doing justice to us or not. And I too firmly believe that the way COVID was fought in India is a real example of many other countries, especially the countries which are developing, to for them for future, that if any natural calamity is something like this comes, they can look up to India to provide either the solutions or develop their own indigenous solutions in their countries. <laughs> Healthcare, despite all the progress that we have made in last 75 years, continues to be a subject of great concern to most of us in this audience as well. And therefore, it's important that every aspect of healthcare is actually looked into. And the government also is very keen on promoting many different aspects. And for the first time in several years, the budget of the Ministry of Health was dramatically increased last year. I think it's about 65,000 crores or something this year. It was very dramatically increased. And organizations like ICMR and all are being very well supported for doing research for actually seeing the surveillance or epidemiology or whatever. And we do hope that in the next 25 years, it would transform the healthcare practice also in the country through the support of our government and through the support of larger public in many of the aspects that I've seen. Now, one area where India can take lead in the next 25 years, and is one area really that India ought to take a lead, is to tell the humanity how to live sustainably. The sustainable living is the major issue that is confronting us today, right? Our carbon emissions are about 55 billion tons, megatons every year. It's huge, 55 billion tons of carbon dioxide that we are releasing into air every year. We have to come to net zero. We don't want to emit any carbon dioxide anymore. Lot of natural resources that we are using are actually causing great distress to the environment. And if our solutions have to come, they have to come very innovative solutions. They may be based on deep science or they may be based simple by creative ideas. And I'm very hopeful that the younger audience who is present here would take us to that particular era, 25 years from now. And I do hope some of the younger people take up this as a cause in your life, that how do we make humanity as a sustainable race in the planet? How do we make our nature which is good to everyone. How, does, how do all the plants, animals, insects, and human beings live peacefully? And how do we reduce our impact on the nature that we have caused through anthropogenic activities in the past? I am very hopeful that the generation which is present here would take us to that time. I do hope that I'll be alive in 2047 to see what is happening. And I do hope some of you would have made great contributions toward that particular aspect. Thank you all so very much.